Hey, what's up, guys? And welcome to episode 26 of Mr. Millennial's Revenge. I'm your host, Nick DiMaria. Thanks for tuning in. On the podcast this week is cornetist, educator, and composer, Taylor Ho Bynum. I am super excited to share this conversation with you guys. I've known Taylor for a little while, uh, studied with him uh, a little informally, if you will, a little under the radar. Uh, No, uh, Taylor is one of the truest voices on the instrument in this day and age, and I was very excited to have him on the show. And uh, he used to live down the road from me. So another actual New Haven musician. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, not all musicians on the show are going to be from New Haven, but I do want to stick to the all things jazz in New Haven logo at the bottom of the uh, of the show notes there. Anyway, I'm rambling already because I'm really excited to sh- share this episode with you. Uh, like I said, Taylor is a true uh, original voice. On the instrument, he plays cornet, he uh, is a composer, he uh, has a sextet, a nonet, and I believe a dectet. Uh, But basically, he has many projects, and they're all incredible. And we get into them a little bit in the interview. He is a regular uh, roster member of Firehouse 12 Records. And uh, if you're familiar with uh, Firehouse 12's discography i'm sure you're familiar with taylor he has put out some excellent albums over the last uh you know 15 years i want to say you know yeah anyway uh no it was great to catch up with him he's a funny guy brilliant guy um it felt like a reunion like many of the interviews on the show it felt like i was catching up with an old friend and we talk about cornet we talk about music in general and we talk about education he is now teaching up at dartmouth and um and you know we'll get into that i don't i don't want to give away too much before the interview ah it's it's driving me crazy i want to say so much but i'm like no got to keep people listening right <laughs> so uh no check it out uh really excited to uh to share that with you guys uh so like i said uh, previously, the New Haven Jazz Underground is partnering with the Black Rock Social House located on Fairfield Avenue in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Our Sunday Jazz Brunch has begun and it went off without a hitch. Fantastic. The food's incredible. The atmosphere is incredible. The drinks are incredible. Mark and his staff and his team are incredible. Go down to Black Rock Social House. It's the old Walrus and Carpenter building. I'm going to keep using that because I know a lot of people remember uh, where that uh, former uh, establishment was. So it's, it's, it'll help people, uh, help people know where they're going. But no, it's a true, original, great spot. And uh, yeah, we are going to be announcing officially... I guess right now is unofficially uh, we're going to be doing a Wednesday night jazz series starting mid April. So keep an eye out, follow us on social media, keep an eye out for uh, when we launch the Wednesday night jazz series at black rock social house. It's going to be great. We're going to rotate bands every week. Every Wednesday will be a different band. So excited. Um, And that reminds me, things are starting to open back up. And what does that mean? Well, that means that our first home, Three Sheets, on Elm Street and New Haven, is going to be opening their doors around the same time, early to mid-April. And I'm calling all members of the Jazz Underground, whether you were a frequent uh, you know, player at the jam session or not, go and support Three Sheets. They have really struggled during the pandemic and had to be shut down for a little bit. And they're coming back, and we need to show them our support. So please keep an eye out. You know, again, watch our social media. Keep an eye out for when um, you can go order food. They're not going to have music right away, but they will have dining in and takeout. If you're not comfortable uh, dining in, the get takeout, man, it's it's delicious. 
And it is one of the best hangs in the city. And it's our home. It's where the underground truly started. So we've got a new place, Black Rock Social House. We've got our old place, uh, Three Sheets. Support them. Go check it out because these are the places that the music's coming back to, man. We're going to have... Uh, you know, we're going to have our, our our sessions back. Can you believe it? We're actually going to have the jam session back. It's insane. It's insane. It's been too long. And um, what better way to celebrate a fucking year of fucking COVID with possibly a jam session not too far away from now. So go check out those establishments. Cafe 9 also announced that they are reopening. They have a calendar uh, posted on their Facebook page. Go support Paul and his team at Cafe Nine. Um, you know, it's it's how the you know, it's how it's gonna go. It's what you're gonna hear from me. Go support these establishments. They are our homes. And they, you know, we all struggled, but a lot of these places really struggled hard. So uh go check out Cafe Nine. Go to Out to Lay Florian. The jazz brunch is still going on. I'm hoping to get back our th- uh Thursday night session there. Um you know, things are looking good. The last few weeks have been great and promising. So I'm hoping that we can, um, you know, bring back that series too. And that would be three fucking series, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Can you fucking believe it? It's only going to happen if you support the scene. So get out there and support. Um, speaking of, uh, supporting the scene, the next mind, the hang, if I, Get my phone out quick enough is April 8th, and it will feature the New Haven Jazz Underground All-Stars concert part deux. Um, We did an All-Stars concert, uh, I believe, in the fall, and um, basically what that entailed was, uh, you know, to thank some of our longest um, uh, and most devoted uh, financial supporters we put together a band of our patrons. So this is a patron centric band and they will be uh, playing some great tunes for you from the Ellie center of contemporary art on Trumbull street. We are going to stream it on our uh, Facebook page. So be on the lookout for that. And uh, yeah, I'm going to get to the interview in just a second, but first I got to do my commercial, the new Haven jazz underground It's a grassroots community based organization dedicated to producing Concerts, clinics, and jam sessions all in the name of jazz in the great city of New Haven, Connecticut, the pizza capital of the world. We need your support. Please go to patreon.com. Sign up. Patreon.com slash NHVJU to be specific. Sign up for one of our tiers. We have four tiers. The uh, very first tier is just $2 a month. For 2 bucks. you can uh, help uh, uh, financially support jazz in the city of New Haven. Uh, that uh, tier two is five bucks. Hey man, if you're a musician and you can help us out at five bucks a month, that puts you into our um, running to you know host a jam session, be in the mind, the, you know, uh, uh, play the mind the hang concert. You know, it's a, you know our new motto is for us by us. So you know, a way of saying thank you to our financial supporters who are musicians. Uh, There's perks, man. I have no problem admitting it. There are perks. Now, it doesn't mean we don't book people who don't give us money. That's never been the case. But if you want to be pushed to the front of the line, that's always been the situation with us, then become a $5 Patreon um, subscriber because you're helping the scene directly. So go to patreon.com slash nhvju sign up for as low as two dollars you could do five you could do ten you could do twenty all of it goes to producing concerts clinics jam sessions and paying working musicians a lot of them are the people we know and love dearly so we've been able to uh, keep things going even during a pandemic so let's keep it going now all right so again one more time patreon.com slash nhvju like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash NHVJU. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. We are NHV Jazz on YouTube is our channel where you can find every episode of Mr. Millennial's Revenge. Also, you can find the podcast at Apple Podcasts under Mr. Millennial's Revenge. And if you do, please, 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 I beg you, leave a rating. Because the more ratings you get, the more Apple like pushes the podcast up its, you know, its ladder so that more and more people see it. So we're still small and mighty, but with more ratings, 
it, you know, it just increases our exposure. So if you've done that one already, I appreciate it. If you haven't yet, please, please, please hit that, um, you know, hit a, a good rating for us. Hit subscribe. I think I've said enough. Let's get to the interview. So like I said, up uh, up top, Taylor Hobynum is a cornetist. He's a composer. He's a, a band leader. He's uh, associated with the uh, musician Anthony Braxton. If you're unfamiliar with him, uh, I strongly urge you to pause the podcast, look up Anthony Braxton in his vast career. Uh, Taylor it has been part of that since I think the mid-O's, early to mid-O's, let's say. Um, Taylor is an incredible guy, incredible player, uh, got like a t Don Cherry kind of vibe for anyone who hasn't listened to him before. And uh, yeah, I, I, you know, like I've said before, he's a good friend. He's a great guy. And I think you will really like this interview. So let's get to my interview with cornetist Taylor Ho Bynum. <laughs> Joining me now via Zoom is cornetist, composer, band leader Taylor Ho Bynum. How are you, man? I'm good, Nick. Good to see you. Yeah, or, that, remotely. Into remotely, dimension. sure. And this is totally not a, uh, a a fake introduction. We haven't been talking for for a few minutes before I hit record. <laughs> um, that's a joke for just the two of us uh, and anyone else who has been on the show. Um, yeah, as I was saying before we hit record, uh, all all you know, most of my uh, experience has been with Google, Google Meets, Google Classroom, all that stuff. It's crazy how all these platforms are just springing up. I just had like a, I just did a workshop where like another music program that apparently what, you know, uh, has been around for a few years, but is now available for my educational uh, use uh, has been brought to my attention. And it's just crazy how good these programs are getting, how accurate they are. Um, I was surprised that <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was in class yesterday. I was, yelling at a kid <laughs> uh and by yelling he was not being safe I, let, let's just he was you were let's say motivating in a he, yeah manner. he was i was preventing him from further breaking covid safety protocols yeah and i happened to look and he was in front of me physically i happened to look down at my laptop and i saw that one of the kids had my you know was was in class with me and had the captioning on so <laughs> So I actually got to see the words I had said to this, this kid. I didn't say anything, anything that a teacher doesn't say. I, you know, I, you know, there was no swearing, there was no <laughs> bullying, there was no nothing, but seeing the words really freaked me out. I yeah. was like, oh, whoa, <laughs> I was like, whoa, you know, like that's just kind of, kind of crazy. Well, so. I think there's like the, the big brother reason. I mean, again, yeah. Yeah. I think we all appreciate, I think we all appreciate that having the video conferencing and technology and transcription technologies and closed captioning and all the stuff we've had, I think maybe has helped us through this year. But I also wonder if we didn't have it, like maybe we just would have been like, cool, kids go outside for a year, learn shit. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if it's, it doesn't, and I feel with music, you know, we're doing our very best to make up for it. I don't know what you've been doing. You know, I made a very conscious choice with my teaching outside of one-on-one -on -one lessons where I might listen to a student play or listen to what someone's working on. For ensemble stuff, I'm like, we're just doing straight music history appreciation. You know, we're, we're not sure. gonna try to play because I just feel the compromises one is forced to, you know, I don't wanna teach an entire band to play on a click track separately and edit it together. I just feel that's not what this music's about. So I'm like, I'd rather everyone take this, it's not, and it's hard because it's, you know, do you want to keep your students engaged and motivated by playing, which I think is really important. But I'm also trying to be like, you know, let's do this stuff. Let's not do wildly compromised versions of what we usually do. Let's like take the time to spend on stuff we don't usually get to do, whether it's like yeah. just listening to the music more, appreciating it more, or going to the shed and like do an individual practice. But I, I, I just couldn't bring myself to like teach my students how to play with like a 1.3 second lag time. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, yeah. It's... Yeah. So, so three, <laughs> I'm writing it down. Cause I don't want to forget these three things, three things from, from what you just said. One, I was very, I, I planted my flag very early 
and sternly that I was not going to jump on the uh, virtual band's performance life. You know, props to the folks who would like not give up. Like in the early days no, of lockdown, absolutely. you know, yeah. in the early days of lockdown, when you were seeing these like, you know, Zoom concerts and stuff and people are not together and they're like sounding pretty okay for not being like maybe in the same yeah. country. <laughs> sure. But that got old for me real quick because it kind of symbolized this for me. It was, um, it was a symbol of denialism. I don't know if that's like real dark, but it, you know, cause you can argue that it was like, no, they persevered, but it's like, I went into the, we need to like emotionally check in with ourselves if we're going to be in yeah. this situation. Whereas those zoom concerts to me just look like these futile efforts to basically deny the situation we were in. So I was just like, I'm not doing those. I'm I, it, I I've done streamed concerts where like the bands, you know, I'm with the other three or four guys in the group. I'll do those, you know, cause that's just like, basically you're making a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. Um, but the zoom concerts, I was, I was not too keen on. Um, the second thing is I, you know, sometimes I find myself pondering what the pandemic would have looked like if it happened when like I was a kid, like it, mm -hmm. what, 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 you know, what would it be like if this was 1997, I'm in seventh grade, you know, in that year, what, what would have it looked like? And the first thing that comes to mind is there'd be a lot more forts built, like a lot more like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah, my, yeah, yeah. my backyard, my parents' backyard would have been entrenched. There would be <laughs> literal trenches in, in these structures and substructures built yeah. because seriously, there was no way, you know, cause man, you know, that was like close enough to be, uh, 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 uh you know, teaching in the sixties. There's, there's no virtual stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it would have been, there would have been no school, but mm -hmm. I would, you know, I would have gotten sick of TV. I got sick of TV this time around. So, <laughs> you know, there would have been a lot of structures built. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of booby, not dangerous, but I think there'd be a lot of booby traps set for no, the neighborhood. Yeah, I feel like, you know, I feel, yeah. I mean, I understand. And it's, again, there's so many issues around availability of technology and equity and what someone's home situation is and how much they need to, I mean, I, it's such a complex issue, but I definitely do feel, yeah, as as useful as technology. I'm, you know, me. I'm a, I'm kind of a hardcore luddite to begin with. You know, this is why we blow air through pieces of metal for our joy and fulfillment. Sure. But uh, yeah, I, it, it, I just think it's important that we recognize the double-edged nature of it and what might be the long-term positive or negative ramifications. Both the bigger picture of what does it mean that all of us spent this much time on screens for an entire year yeah. and what does it mean in terms of musical development childhood development i mean it's all sorts of stuff it is it is fascinating and yeah. what this will mean for all of us as sort of artists and musicians and improvisers how do you process this will be it'll be it'll be something uh, you know yeah i've been i've been saying that there's uh 2021 and two are going to be like uh you know the 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 two the year span where like a million records come out because everyone's just <laughs> but you know before i forget yeah there's there's some dark there's like some dark elements to it because sometimes i you know especially like over the summer when it was really setting in that we were in this for the long haul i was like wow we are all going through some serious trauma that we're all gonna have to talk about in a couple of years you know <laughs> like we're all gonna have to face this together um but uh i i did i do appreciate the you know especially with my job I do appreciate the push to uh, focus on emotional learning and mm -hmm. social learning and, and like the stuff that's so been overlooked, mm -hmm. not only in schools, but in American society to begin with. Um, I hope that we don't go back to forgetting what like, you know, what got us through this? Like, you know, I, I see the kid, the kids bringing in yoga mats and like they're doing meditation, like during, you know, between the mathematics and language arts lesson, they do a five minute meditation, a mindful meditation. That's so great. I don't want that to go away. I want that holistic approach to continue. So I'm, I'm hoping that like, you know, all the hobbies people picked up, you know, like some of them are kind of cheap, you know, like people were like making bread and stuff like hey man, that. I but like it, my bread making. Yeah, I'm sure. Sure. Oh, I'm <laughs> sure you absolutely. I'm not, I'm not shitting on making bread. I'm just saying, <laughs> Like, 
You're all not gonna the get li- any of my bread then. Man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> none of the. Tr- I, I I don't want them to be like 2020 trends. I want them to be yeah. like people continue to do this stuff. No, absolutely. You know? And I feel like it, it was also nice. I felt for me, you know, teaching, you know, this music at a college level, it was a nice excuse to do what I always want to do, especially at a liberal arts school where it's not dealing with like necessarily conservatory kids or pre-professional musicians, but just really talk about the way the music is relevant, you know, what its socio-political context, what's its economic context, how is it, how is, you know, the sort of improvisational practice pioneered by black creative music relevant to all of us as we navigate like complex and difficult times. Like it definitely, made very uh, foregrounded and made explicit things that I would hope are always part of my teaching and always implicit in my teaching and my practice, but it really foregrounded those things in a way that I actually thought was very valuable. And I, and I do think, um, yeah, yeah, it worked. I hope, I don't know, hopefully yeah. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, I want to, I want to get into that stuff, but first um, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, you, you, you used to be, we're not going to hold this against him. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you used to be, used to be based in new Haven and you were, uh, were you... much love for the Elm city. Oh yeah. Right. Like I, have right a, yeah. I was there for 11 years, 11 years. Um, okay. Keep a very, you know, still keep a very close connection with firehouse 12 sure. and a lot of friends in, in new Haven. So it's nice to reconnect with it through you on this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, funny. I know it's funny. Uh, I sent you the, uh, the email. <laughs> to be on the show and you're you were very funny but nice about it you're like i don't live in town anymore man so i don't know if i qualify i was like it's not like it's not like a city limits only thing but um, uh uh that, that i got a good chuckle out of that but um can you give uh give us give us like the 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 250 word the fi- you know the the quick bio about about yourself just to make sure we're all on the same page about you so you know where where did you grow sure. up when you were residing in new haven what were you doing yeah, you know, so, studied with, worked with. That's the 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 the, the blurb. Give me the blurb. Yeah. Right? So I would say, you know, I'm a cornet player that's interested in weird music and composer and band leader. I grew up in Boston. Uh, my first major mentor was the wonderful trombonist and tuba player Bill Lowe, um, which I feel very very lucky because I was growing up in the late '80s, early '90s when I was first getting into this music. Um, which is really kind of the height of the Young Lion era of sort of conservatory style jazz education, which I don't think would have attracted me the same way. And I've never Mm. been particularly good at. Um, But I did hook up with Bill, who's this amazing musician and educator who, you know, worked with everybody from Frank Foster and Clark Terry to like Mulhall Richard Abrams and Henry Threadgood. So, excuse me, Bill really represented such a broad perspective and broad embrace of the music just so to have him as my first mentor was incredibly important and then luckily became a lifelong friend still yeah he's in your work together your yeah we still play right? together yeah. collaborate yeah. to this day and which is yeah. again such a gift to give someone that you know he met me when I was like a 15 year old kid and now 30 years later you know he plays in my band like that's right. such a generous part of mentorship and friendship that I sure appreciate. So, sure. so I worked with Bill. He really introduced me to the music. And then I went to Wesleyan University where I studied with Anthony Braxton, uh, became very close to Anthony and Jay Hogard and Fronok Lath and all the great teachers that were there at the time. Um, I did drop out of Wesleyan a couple times, <laughs> as, as one tends to. And I did spend one term at the new school, uh, Jazz Conservatory in New York, which, which very important to me, actually, almost more to clarify what I didn't want to do. You know, again, that was sort of my mm. chance to both experience that more jazz conservatory style education that I talked about, um, recognize the technical skills I needed to just be a player, you know, that yeah. was good. Just going yeah. to a liberal arts school, you know, I could roll out of bed and be the best trumpet player at Wesleyan. That was sure. a great accomplishment. So to be in a context where my ass, where I was getting my ass kicked by like 20 better trumpet players was good. Just, okay, if I want to be professional, I need to meet this technical level. But conceptually, I was so much more attracted to kind of the broad perspective that Braxton was bringing to his work than I was to the more kind of jazz is this definition that we see in most, you know, not everybody and not everybody in the new school. There's some people in the new school who are teaching who are very broad ranging in their perspective, but almost more the students really, almost the sort of the attitude of what, of, of, you know, of what they thought the music was supposed to be. Sure. And that didn't. So anyways, I ended up back at Wesleyan 
After that, I moved to Boston, uh, where I started working um, on the scene there and started to develop some great relationships like with uh, Jim Hobbs, a wonderful alto saxophone player and composer in the fully celebrated orchestra, and like the Aardvark Jazz Orchestra, Mark Harvey, who's a great big band leader up there, and working with a lot of, um, and through Bill, connecting with a lot of the figures in the, in that had been, you know, he, he is really a, a leading figure in the Boston jazz scene for many decades, so hooking up mm. with a lot of his peers. Um, during that period, I also got the chance to start working with folks like Cecil Taylor um, and Bill oh, wow. Dixon, who were both, you know, very important influences and mentors for me. Um, and then I ended up going back to Wesleyan, got a graduate degree in composition to work more with Anthony. After that, moved to New York, spent about six years in New York, developed, you know, playing on the scene, doing the gigs. I, I for a while, I was uh, co-running the Festival of New Trumpet Music with Dave Douglas. Um, during this period, I also started uh, Firehouse 12 Records label with Nick Lloyd, who had started the studio there and helped him sort of develop that label. Um, then ultimately moved back to New Haven, lived there very happily for 11 years. During that period, I continued working with Braxton in addition to my own work as a band leader and composer and sort of starting to really try to develop my own sound and aesthetic. Um, I ended up uh, not just working with Anthony, but sort of becoming his right hand person and running the Tricentric Foundation, which is the organization right. built to support and produce his work. And I did that for about 10 years. And then a couple of years ago, uh, got this teaching gig up at Dartmouth College, where I'm at now, where I lead the jazz orchestra and teach you know, jazz history and composition and improvisation and stuff. So I um, started splitting my time between New Hampshire, Vermont, and New Haven. And then during the pandemic, finally was like, you know, maybe it's time to consolidate around sure. the steady paycheck. So we pulled up stakes from our beloved New Haven home. And now I live in Windsor, Vermont. Um, okay. So that's kind of, yeah, that's sort of a, a not so short, short version. No, no, that's great. That's, that's great. <laughs> Some of the stuff you... I've done or background, or, I'm sure I left a lot of good people out and a lot yeah. of interesting moments, but, but, you know, you come i completely forgot that you were involved in the in the Fet festival of new trumpet music how did how did how did you get involved uh with dave douglas on that because that's definitely uh an organization that's like significantly gr uh, grown that you know i always joke that like some things the pandemic uh actually made better <laughs> and um one is the DMV is now like a <laughs> That's true. Getting yeah. the other to make an appointment at the DMV yeah, is magical. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. My barber <laughs> shop is now appointment only. Uh, I, man, not to get on a team. No waiting around in the, in the uh, hallway. No but... matter how early I got there, there were always a dozen old guys there before yeah. me. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, the DMV. I'm actually a fan of putting the plastic barriers in front of uh, – I just played a gig on Sunday. There was this, like, plastic – uh, window, I guess, like kind of like a bank teller's window in front of the <laughs> band. And I was like, wow, I could hear myself pretty well now. <laughs> really not, nice. They won't hit me with the rotten vegetables yeah, anymore. Right, I yeah. have some protection. I like this. <laughs> it definitely, it definitely had that, um, that, uh, 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 that scene, it had the vibe of the scene in blues brothers when they yeah. play the country club with yeah. the chicken wire, it definitely had that vibe. They didn't throw anything at us. However, I would, I'm a huge fan of just being able to hear myself better because yeah. Sure, I've got the microphone and the and the and the monitor, but now like I've got this physical barrier that's bouncing the sound back, and it's not too far away. It's it's glorious. Um, and anyway, but I and I thoroughly enjoyed that the font festival was streamed this time. Yeah, I actually got to. I yeah, still, I still am sort of on the advisory board. I'm not as actively involved as I was. You know, okay. for about two or three years, I was really deeply involved. Um, and then the last, I sort of stepped away. At a certain point, it was just I was helping run Font, I was helping run Firehouse Twelve Records, I was helping run Tricentric, and I was trying to be a musician, and I was still, and I was work, you know, so it's just too much. So I'm sure. stepping away from from Font and from Firehouse Twelve at, in as active a role. But I've always stayed connected with them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with the, that festival, I mean, I, one of the things I've always appreciated about you know, so it was founded by Roy Campbell and Dave Douglas, I think, right. in what 2003. It's um, not it was, like in the grand scheme of things, it's not that old. Like no, I, I remember actually, when it, it, it's, it's not that old, but it's also approaching us. I think it's 19th year next yeah, year, which is actually yeah. quite impressive if you consider what it takes to have a grassroots arts festival, music festival continue. So, um, and I, 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 it's funny, I say this to a lot of like students that study with me and stuff, just never underestimate what it means to like give, but like if something helps you out, give back to it. Sure. Like I think, as, I think that's one of the reasons I was able to develop such close relationships with a lot of my mentors 
is this sort of real interest. Okay, well, can I do to help this art? You know, can I write a grant for them? Can I help sure. organize a gig for them? Can I help call the rehearsal for them? Like, I think that's always been part of my attitude, which I, I think has benefited me to develop relationships with some of my heroes and, and mentors. And Font was the same thing. Like Font gave me a couple of gigs in the early years. And so I really appreciate it. So I think I just mm. reached out to Dave and Roy and was like, man, if y'all ever need anything, I'm happy to help. That's simple, and huh? I had some pretty good, at the time, my day job was working at Creative Capital, which is this grant, uh, grant making or later on, I actually became a funded artist from them, which is great. I actually quit so I could apply for the grant. <laughs> this is a great grant. But um, for the, at that time, I was working as a grant writer for them. So I had some pretty good grant writing skills. I'd run a I'd gotten involved back when I lived in Boston after I'd graduated undergrad and before I'd gone to grad school, I'd gotten involved with two different festivals. One was an interdisciplinary arts festival called Art Stuff that was at Northeastern University that I helped run. And I'd also helped uh, come on, there's a, a musicians festival called the Autumn Uprising. It was sort of, a, sort of a celebration of the Boston avant music scene. Cool. And so I ended up being one of the curators of that. So I'd had some experience, you know, doing some concert presenting and festival stuff. Um, and so I just sort of said that to Dave and Roy and it was sort of good timing because I think Roy was at a point at which he was ready to sort of step away from active leadership of it. Um, yeah. so, I, so I came on board and helped, uh, helped run the festival for two or three years, which is great and really a great way to connect with other trumpet players or, you know, cornet players. I always said it, I always said it should be FONC and not FONT. It'd be a much cooler acronym. Um, festival of new cornet music and like parentheses trumpet but um <laughs> but yeah so that was and one of the things i liked about that festival that i thought i've always been interested i've never been super i've never been a genre purist you know and i think obviously that's a yeah. big influence from a lot of my mentors and some like anthony who just uses the term trans idiomatic music like he hates being called jazz or being called classical or being called it's like no i love all of that and i make my own music um, and one of the things I liked about Font, even though I think it's always carried a heavy jazz tinge because Dave and Rory were the founders, it's always explicitly been about cross genre explorations by looking at a music through an instrument rather than a genre, it really opens up stuff. So yeah, like yeah. one of my favorite concerts, we premiered a brass quintet of Charles Warren in the same night on a double bill with me conducting a Ornette Coleman trumpet concerto that had only been played twice before. You know whoa, what I mean? Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. like that was so cool. Like we got to do stuff like that, you yeah, know, commissioning yeah. new work, celebrating work for the instrument that really breaks those boundaries. And so I, 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 I learned a lot from it. I really enjoyed it. And I, and I really appreciate that it's still going. Yeah. Um, the other thing that we started while I was there that's continued is honoring each year, you know, so I think yeah. we gave, I think yeah. we got a Leo Smith, speaking of New Haven, represent. Yeah, right. Yeah, recognize. Famous trumpet player. No yeah. disrespect to you or me, but. <laughs> but I'm I mean, sure we were runner like ups. The mantle of, we're not against the mantle, maybe the nation's yeah. oldest trumpet player. So, sure. So, you know, we gave Wadada an award and Bobby Bradford and Kenny Wheeler and yeah. Lori Frank and a lot of players and teachers and artists who, Wilmer Wise, like a lot of people who wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily have gotten as much recognition. And so that was really nice. This yeah. year they, celebrated Makita Carroll. I was just going to say, yep, yep. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I, I think it's a great, I, I very much stand by that work and stand by that festival and, and yeah. enjoyed that time. Yeah. Um, oh, that's, it's, it's, that's great. And you really threw me for a loop when you were like, I just asked <laughs> because um, so, so I vote, you know, Dave Douglas was one of my first like living heroes, I guess, like discovered him in high school when he, when he formed his quintet you know, with Clarence Penn and Yuri mm -hmm. Kane and those guys. And he was like kind of my guy for, for my formidable years. Everyone else was, you know, of the, the, you know, I say the classic generation, mm -hmm. you know, the mm -hmm. most of them were dead. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, uh, so that's kind of how like the, the, the festival of new trumpet music, you know, got on my radar really early. And then I, I had forgotten that you were involved. And then just hearing that, how simple it was in, in the grand scheme of things that you just asked to, to help is, is remarkable. Cause I was like, Oh wow. How did that meeting happen? But like Dave's always had this like broad palette of, of projects he's worked in. Mm -hmm. So like, it doesn't seem that far fetched that you guys would cross paths, but that's, that's really cool. I'm, and I, I am super appreciative of the font festival especially again, bringing it back around with it being streamed this year, I got to see a lot of the acts that one were 
you know, in other countries. Yeah, absolutely. But also in genres I might not have checked out. So mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you know, when it was in New York and it was what, like, you know, three or four days or something, you know, I, I hate to sound like a curmudgeon, but it's like, you know, cost would mm -hmm. co cost and interest would be factors. So I would be like, OK, who's listed that I want to see? Who, who do you know you like? Right? Yeah, yeah. No, right? It, it's, it's true. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, you know, and then like or, you know, something I've heard of that I want to make sure I see. And then it's like, well, you know, if it's four days and it, you know, and I only have enough bread to get to the city like this many times or I can't, you know, I don't have a free night or something. What, what's the priority? This was the first time where like I sat down and like watched all these groups that I never would have checked out. I it's all due to convenience. I'm not going to like I'm not <laughs> I'm not trying to like, you know, claim that this like thing happened. It, it was clearly out of convenience, but it allowed me to hear groups and, and artists that I, I probably would have overlooked, especially when it comes to like the newer people, because, mm -hmm. you know, you don't know their name or you don't know, you know, you, you don't know what they're doing. And and again, you're so focused on the artists you want to check out, you mm -hmm. kind of miss them. So mm -hmm. I was able to like check out some of these, you know, upcoming um, musician, you know, trumpet players. And, and I give, and I really, would, nice. I give Dave and Ro, I mean, both of them a lot of credit for starting it and Dave for keeping it alive. I mean, particularly because the platform is provided for younger players. I mean, I have to say like, while I was there, which was except like we gave, you know, Amir El Safar and Jonathan Finlayson and Peter yeah. Evans and Nate Woolley, like all of their like first commissions yeah. as like in New York, you know what I mean? And I think that's, that's something that's really exciting and sort of having that thing be like, oh shit, like Roy and Dave asked me on a gig. Like that means a little more than just some random, you know, club promoter. Yeah. You know? So yeah. It, it was nice. It did, it did a lot to, there's something very nice about the community created by that. And I, and I feel like, um, yeah, especially, and especially, you know, I think there's also something always very fun about, you know, I, even I, you know, I'm a, we, we, we went through, you know, studying to be jazz trumpet player. So there's certainly like a, a nerdy, you know, baseball statsy aspect to it where it can just get out of hand when people sort of get, you know, into long discussions of lead pipes and mouthpieces. And sure. Stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, that's never been my thing necessarily. That's why I play a 120 year old cornet, you know, it keeps me oh, out of those conversations. I, but, um, I don't even know what the lead pipe is, but the board size is. I know it's like about a quarter tone out of tune and I have a great time with it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it also was great that I, I also really love, uh, I think something's learned when you actually focus through a single instrument. I actually often really enjoy, you know, bands that where there's repetition of an instrument because I yeah. think sometimes, you know, if there's three trumpet players in the band, you really recognize what are you hearing that's the trumpet and what are you hearing that those individuals? Yeah. You know, I feel it really clarifies that line between what's an instrument's technique and what's an individual's aesthetic. Um, that I, so yeah, I always enjoy that. I always enjoy that. And I, I found, I've learned a lot from that festival and, you know, checked out a lot of great players from it. And so, yeah, yeah. It's always For nice sure. I've been to that space. I feel like, uh, you know, this is kind of, this is kind of out of left field, but it's like you mentioned Jonathan, Peter and, and Nate. I've always felt like I had this kind of like connection to those guys specifically, because when I was getting, first into the font going to see the font festival they were like the 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 young you know this kind of contradicts what i just said but they were like some of the new names that were being uh kind of introduced at mm -hmm. the time and, I, and so i remember i remember like seeing the, their sets and stuff and just being like all oh, this you know we're checking them out beforehand and being like oh this is so cool you know yeah, yeah. um but yeah font festival uh, i i love it i'm, I'm so appreciative of it you, you so you were playing, you, you were talking, you play a 120 year old cornet. What is your, what is your axe? Or, I am also well, not I, a gearhead. So I, I, I was exaggerating. It's 113 years old. Oh, okay. It's fair. That's fair. It's a 1908 uh, con, uh, is what it's called. Oh. Um, I started playing, I switched over from cornet in kind of my early mid twenties when I was living in Boston. Um, I had been playing trumpet and, you know, starting to play around town and gigging and sort of doing the freelancer, you know, I was working yeah. at, you know, teaching after school gig in the, during the year and helping produce that arts festival in the summer and then playing gigs and, you know, playing salsa gig one night, a big band gig and next night, like, you know, one of the main gigs of that time though was this great group fully celebrated orchestra, as I mentioned before with Jim Hobbs and, and uh, on saxophone and Timoshenko on bass. 
and Django Carranza was playing drums at the time. And we had a weekly gig, which was great. So we had the, you know, Jim's this incredible composer. We had the whole book memorized. Nice. You know, like every Wednesday night was like church for me, like to sure. show up and just play, you know, yep. two sets at the end. Of, and I loved that. Um, Where was this? Where was this? this? Green Street. Well, we, we called it, we joked about it. It was the world's slowest the, the, the world's slowest world tour. We, we were in Central Square in Cambridge and moved through three different venues over the course of three and a half years. Wow. So we played at the Green Street Grill for about two years and then moved kind of across the block and down the street to the enormous room for about six months. That place closed and then went back across the street to the Middle East for about another year. So wow. we, we made, over the course of three and a half years, we made it two blocks to three different I venues. I remember uh, Central Square. I did a. I, I always say I did a stint in uh, Somerville for for yeah. about a year, so I'm I'm quasi familiar with the area. Um, but, uh, but no, it was uh, great. And so yeah, having yeah. that spot was so important. Anyways, one of the other bands, Timo, in addition to being a great bass player, is also a great saxophone player. And he had gotten me to join this uh, New Orleans style brass band called the oh, Hot cool. Holly Brass Band. Actually, I noticed you're wearing a Red Sox cap. It's a yes. great gig, man. We used to open, uh, play on Lansdowne Street before the Red Sox games. And then the ushers would let us go in and just grab any standing room only seats. We could oh, play. cool. So oh, I remember cool. I caught the, the last, the game I caught was was uh, when Derek Lowe threw a no-hitter and Ricky Henderson hit his career's final leadoff home run. And I had like third row seats for that game because I played, you know, New Orleans jazz outside yeah. the stadium beforehand and then wandered in for the, for the game. Oh. Bless yes. my oh man. Whenever I hear names like Ricky Henderson, I get, I get so nostalgic. Um, that no, that's 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 fucking cool. Um, but anyways, in the yeah, yeah. Of- I can't talk about baseball because I I took off the entire year. I just yeah. I was which, lamenting which it. So, it was weird. Yeah, like, what's a yeah. sixty game season? That's just right, the right. Yeah. Um, anyway, but so I Timo was actually the one that suggested. He's like, man, have you ever thought about playing the cornet? Because you know, a lot of he like a lot of you know. Obviously, I was really into Don Cherry and you know, Bobby Bradford and Oludara and, and the sort of post sixties experimentalists who played cornet, but also, you know, I'm a huge Rex Stewart fan and Ray Nance and, mm. you know, and all of those, like a lot of my favorite players were cornet players. And I realized yeah. that. Yeah. And so, because I think, as I mentioned before, like I suck at harmony, that's not my interest. I'm much more <laughs> excited by like timbre and sound. And I sure. think cornet is a much more, it's not great for up-tempo bebop. I mean, Thad Jones could pull it off because he's Thad Jones. He's an alien. Right perfect we can't do yeah. that and that utterly pretty much pulled it off but in a very unique way but like well there were i think, think that's the two i think that's yeah, the only that's two I know. Yeah. <laughs> although you know freddie hubbard on those uh, yeah 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 but but stuff. but you know what i are i i've gotten into this conversation before however the 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 freddie hubbard as far as i know the freddie hubbard appearances on cornet the harmony is rather modal and you know yeah. and stretching to begin with so i feel like he, you know, you listen to his solos. It, it's that whole. Um, he played cornet mostly on um, on the Herbie records on on, on Empyrean Isles, which is yeah. like one of my favorite records. He played it on um, Pax by Andrew Hill, mm-hmm. uh, and then I believe um, Dialogue with Bobby Hutch or maybe Contours. Which I know Sam Rivers is in the band. There's actually yeah. like a session photo, and it's like, and, and I've I've actually gotten into this because I'm like, man, those albums allowed him to be mm-hmm. way more liberal with harmony. That's probably why he was able to get out those lines because he didn't have mm-hmm. to, you know, the cornet. I'm very fascinated by by people who play the cornet. Um, I recently like, got why into would you do that to yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I'm really into lately as of this year, Teru Masahino. Oh yeah. yeah now he yeah. spent like me, I don't know if you want to play much cornet. I didn't know, I was yeah. Play he's kind of like 50% cornet. Really? Like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it's tough. Sometimes I've been wrong, but like it, you can find a lot of clips of him, at, um, the Mount Fuji jazz festival mm-hmm. that, that was like in the late 80, mid to late eighties mm-hmm. into the early nineties. He's pretty much on cornet and all the experience really? uh, and all the, and all, yeah. And all the performances and man, well, first off, not to get into too much of a tangent, I'm pretty sure Teru Masahino is some kind of kindred spirit to myself. I, I actually, I, I, not to sound weird. I hear so much of my own approach in his playing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's insane. It took me until now to f- discover him because yeah. I was like, wow, I feel like that's a line I would play. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've spent a lot of time, Getting to know him. It's always kind of, I feel the person that was like that for me is Mangezi Feza. Okay. Um, Amazing South African cornet player and trumpet player. 
I didn't hear him until like my late twenties, early thirties. And I was yeah. like, holy, like shit, that's everything I wanted to do. <laughs> like, yeah. how is this, how, how have I not heard of this person before and how are they doing everything that I want to do? Yeah. Yeah. So I it mean, demonstrates how small sometimes, especially as American, because it's so rare that we get international artists on our shores because yes. the U.S. is yep. so shitty with our support. <laughs> yeah. So like, yep. I didn't discover the Mungesi phase and the whole South African scene that was so that had expatted to Europe and was so big in the UK and in Europe yeah. until I had started touring Europe because I never, you know, you never got exposed to it in the US. Right, right. And well, so it's the funny. Same thing with Terry Masahino. I probably wouldn't have yeah. heard of him and except actually Jay Hogarth had done a record with him while I was in college. So Jay gave me a copy of that record. Wow. So I, I have to check him out early because I was really into that. You know, I'll have to look, I'll have to look it up. Um, yeah, I was, you know, my mentor is Eddie Henderson and I've talked, you know, so I, I was talking to Eddie a few months ago and I said, you know who I just got into? Uh, no, 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 no. It, he was showing me a lick and he's like, I, Terumasa, I heard Terumasa Hino playing this warming up. They were both playing the Keystone corner or something in the seventies, early eighties. And he heard Terumasa um, warming up and he was playing these like kind of scalar things. He's like, I basically stole that from him and just kind of made it my own thing. And I was like, <gasps> I was like, Terumasa Hino, I'm really into him right now. And he, and, and here's a man who I've, I've I've learned from for like 20 years at this point. And he was like, Oh, I love him. I love his yeah, yeah. playing. And I was like, What? <laughs> you know, it's just, out. Yeah. Out? Yeah. It was just, it was this it was this weird like of course and what yeah. are you, yeah. uh, you know, connection. And it was just yeah. very yeah, it was nice. But yeah, it made me I have a cornet, it's this best 60s best in cornet. I'm like eyeing it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of want to start dabbling in it. But, but this, like I was then Actually, to go all the way back to the story we were talking about earlier. So Timo had recommended it. I got oh, lucky, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one dude that played in the brass band, of course. So of course, there's the dude in the brass band that's like a vintage instrument collector. Of course, there's sure. in the New England style, you know, New Orleans style brass band in Boston. There's going to be the dude who collects the old instruments. Right. So that guy had found another, a, a different, like a 1910 con. Sold it to me for 200 bucks. Came over to my house. Wow. Was like, hey, like said, try it out. It's like I got it in the basement of a guitar store for like, 200 i'll sell it to you for 215 i was like wow. sure. so i bought it and that was the horn i played for the first four or five years i was playing cornet and i brought it to the gig that night was fully celebrated and i just tried it out on a tune i was like okay i'm just gonna try out this new horn on one tune and immediately because the funny thing is hobbs played a vintage con alto from like 1916 okay and once those two horns played together we were in tune in a way we'd never been in tune before you know what i mean like yeah. it really was this thing where the old metal like they recognize each other and vibrated together. Yeah, was, sympathetic frequency. Yeah, kind of stuff. and I was yeah. like, oh shit. And that's, yeah. and that's ultimately one of the things that I love about the cornet is its blend. I, I feel yeah. like trumpets are always a little bit on top of the ensemble and they're sure. designed to be. They're designed yeah. to project on top. Cornets for me really sit inside the ensemble. They blend a little better. It's not as mm. accurate, but a lot more flexible. And as someone who's <laughs> in my aesthetic, I prize flexibility over accuracy. <laughs> so, so <laughs> yeah. you know, and I've just leaned in on that. So yeah, yeah that's, that's how I got in there. And I, I would recommend it, man. It's, it's fun. It gives you, the thing I would say, I find it tough to double on cornet and trumpet. Okay. I found like the, they're close enough. Like I really, to, especially with the old cornets because they're not well slotted. Like I really had to learn to play the instrument and bring, you know, there's no tuning slides on. I'm doing everything with lip and air to get it yeah. sort of played in tune. Yeah, And so I've created so many kind of internalized fixes when I switch to a trumpet that's actually like slotted and in tune. I'm like, I'm moving shit all over the place because yeah. I'm so used to playing the cornet. Like with a flugelhorn is, you know, it's wide enough that it gives me that similar flexibility. And, you know, but, but yeah, I, I found the cornets really became my main, my main instrument back, you know, sort of in my early mid twenties. That's so, that's so interesting. I, you know, when you're a punk asshole high school kid, I'm just thinking about my, my cornet experiences. The kid who played cornet in band was definitely the fourth trumpeter. In band. You know what I mean, like they, they, it was, you looked at it and you went, Oh, a cornet. Those are all the hip parts. Right. Like, Oh, like, I know. Another I good know. reason to play cornet. No one ever gives me a lead trumpet part anymore. Well, well <laughs> I don't I'm talking that shit. Yeah, I yeah. Play no, no. Third or fourth, you get the yeah. solos and you get the interesting harmonies. You know, that's way right. more fun. Right. Well, well, okay. So, concert band specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because in high school, the kid who plays cornet isn't even getting into jazz band. Let's, yeah. let's. You know, but, <laughs> but see, that's the problem of music pedagogy. Though. Right. Gotta, I know. 
I know. I know. It's Rise like, no, I've got a silver horn. I have a silver trumpet. Therefore, I am the loudest, leadiest <laughs> player in the band. And you will, you know, and I graduated to this instrument. Um, no, I know exactly what you mean. I would kill if, it, you know, <laughs> right before the pandemic, I actually was starting the Elm City Big Band. We were all oh, set nice. to go. And, nice, and and I was getting the I was getting the trumpet section together. And uh, I said to a buddy of mine, I was like, I'm taking uh, fourth part. What do you, do you want two or three? He's another yeah. like, you know, small yeah. group player. And he, and, and I, you know, I was just like, do you want trumpet two or do you want trumpet three? Cause I knew he didn't want trumpet one. He, he yeah. wanted a solo and stuff. And he was just like, oh man, well, which one you, t-? I'm like, I'm going to take four. That's that. And he was like, <laughs> all right, I'll take two. And, you know, and um it's funny how you, you know, it's, it's a totally different demeanor. The people who want uh, trumpet one versus trumpet four. It's a whole different art. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's, it's fun. I was teaching a class the other day and I feel like that's been a big part of me figuring out who I was as a musician and also even figuring out who I'm as a teacher or how I teach Yeah, is acknowledging, you know, there's, there's 200 kids graduating from jazz conservatories every year that play jazz better than me, you know, yeah. in the way that you're supposed to play jazz. Right. And right. None of them can, you know, but I do what I do, you know, and rather than try to, you know, lean into the things that I don't, you know, I I just found what I, you know, I just found that aesthetic. That's better to do, be yourself as to the best of your possibility than be the 87th uh, best clone of Clipper Brown or whatever. And I think that's been a good, it's been a good space. And like, you know, I got holes you can drive a truck through, but I've been able to make a, cause I'm like, yeah, if you want someone that's going to play high, kill every one of those notes, give you that lead trumpet thing. Like I got a list of names. They're all great players. Yeah. You know, connect with those people. Cause whatever you do on the horn, you share a technical, you know, you, you worked on the horn to yeah. on a certain way. It's just, you specialize in different things and acknowledging, like, if you want someone that's going to give you really interesting improvisations, good tone, like embrace the larger conceptual macro ideas of what you're trying to do. I'm your person. If you want someone that's going to like kill it on Cherokee and D flat at 400 beats a minute or play like, you know, Maynard Ferguson style lead trumpet. Yep. I am not your guy. Like, and I, and, yeah. and that's great. Like that's kind of the beauty of it. And it's not either or, and I feel the same thing as a teacher. Like I can give the students, I can encourage them to do the stuff I know about. And I think I can be a better teacher by acknowledging what I don't know about and off, you know, delegating it to someone else. And that's, yeah. I feel like that's that's taken me a lifetime to sort of be confident in what I do and be confident in what I don't do and still challenge myself. I still practice Clifford Brown solos all the time. Like sure. I, you know, on a regular basis and it still kicks my ass, but I'm going to acknowledge that that's never going to be the stylistic language I feel most comfortable in yeah. as an artist. So it's something good to do as an exercise and I'm always going to practice that. But what I'm looking for to focus on in my own art in a performative context is going to be the work that, you know, is the stuff that the weird shit that I enjoy, you know? Yeah. I, man, you know, listening to you talk about, about this stuff, it's just bringing a smile to my face. I, I, I have always appreciated your owning that you, you owning where you are in, in your abilities and your, in your concepts and all that stuff, because, I, man, I, you know, not that I regret it, but I went to like your classic, you know, sausage factory jazz school where like I was now I understand it wasn't my fault. And I thought it was. And I wish, you know, some people say like, you know, if could you, if you could ever tell your younger self, what would you tell him? I would never go back to like my single digit years or my teens. I'd go back to like 20 years old and tell myself stick to what you're doing on the you know, musically speaking mm-hmm. because and, and stop listening to them and stop trying to be what you what they want you to be mm-hmm. now because they wanted me you know basically my status in, in college was you don't sound like clifford brown so therefore you're not good mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and i and, and i let that get to me and i let that create this huge well of insecurity um and I wish that I had stuck to my guns and kept pursuing playing the horn to, you know, at my, you know, at my ability. I wish I used the ability I had and branched off from that instead of trying to play things that were out of my element, Mm -hmm. you know, playing like Clifford Brown is out of my element and still basically is like, 
I, you know, and, and this is why I've always uh, admired Eddie's style is he's very liberal when it comes to harmony too, you know? And it's like, once I started owning that and stopped listening to people who were like, well, he doesn't sound like he's playing bebop. I started enjoying myself more. And, and I just did two, I just did two recordings at firehouse 12 and this, this past month and getting ready for the sessions. I was listening to like some of my earliest albums and it's like, you know, so they're, they're 10 ish years old now. And it's like, man, I didn't sound as bad as I thought I did. <laughs> you know, Obviously, I've come I've come a ways, yeah, yeah. but I wish I had had the confidence in myself to enjoy the ride at the time because mm -hmm. I was throwing it, you know, on some of these tunes, I'm throwing in, you know, swells and notes, little Don Cherry stuff, little like, you know, more, you know, I don't know, you know, not to like name specific musicians, but it's like, you know, more avant garde stuff or more challenging stuff that came from the heart. And came from like wanting to make this musical statement in, no, you know, and being worried about like, oh, well, I didn't play X, Y, and Z according to the, the jazz Bible. So I got to like, you know, almost distance myself from these recordings. I, I, what I'm trying to say is I, I wish I had enjoyed myself oh, totally. because the process, the process would have been so much. The, yeah. One of the tragedies of so much contemporary, like so called jazz pedagogy. It's like there's a great line by Ishmael Reed about the failures of monotheism, but he's like, why are you going to try to fit the whole ocean in one bottle? And I feel wow. that's very much what jazz pedagogy has done. It's sort of taken one very specific subset of the music, the one that's sort of easiest to teach in a way because it's the most mathematical in its application, even though one would, of course, say Clifford Brown was never mathematical. He was a genius. He had tone. He had passion. There's all these yeah. different ideas there but you can reduce what Bird or Brownie did to sort of an equation, even though you lose all the meaning in it. Yeah. But that's, and so that's been what's, it's easy to teach. It's easy to sort of grade. You do oh, it, yes. Not do it well. Yes. But it I, also seems like such a travesty, such a misread of what those artists' intentions were, what those artists' forebearers and, you know, what those artists, the people that were working on those artists' legacy was trying to do. And again, right. I think one of the dangerous things about it, definitely it de-radicalizes the music, it deracinates the music, it turns mm -hmm. it into, you know, rather than being kind of a extraordinary journey of creativity against every kind of racial, social, political, and economic constraint, still the urge towards like extraordinary transformative beauty, it yeah. turns this incredibly inspiring process into like a bunch of scales and changes. And I find that that's a, that's a, that's a crime, you know? And I think, I think things are changing. I think the, the, I think I was, came up in the heart of that and you came up in the tail end of that, of that mm. being the sole and dominant aesthetic of jazz education, which yeah. really only lasted a couple of decades, but I think it's sort of bankruptcy has revealed itself, you know, and it doesn't help, you know, and also that's yeah, the thing too, like bit. it, what what's what's out there? What once you get that degree, what is, what are you gonna do with your life other than become another jazz professor? And it's like a giant Ponzi scheme, you know? Like yeah, I think if you yeah. teach the music in terms of it's like what what's always impressed me about your work is not just that you're playing the music, but you're trying to organize stuff, you're trying to make stuff happen, you're taking initiative. And oh, that for me is as much a part of the history as playing the instrument. That's what the AACM did, that's what Ellington did. That's yes. what these people did to fight for your own work and fight to create opportunities for your peers and your colleagues and yourself. That's what the music's about, man. It's not yeah. about like the hip substitution you're putting over an alt chord. It's about right. like creating community and cre like cultivating and fomenting creativity. Yeah. And so I feel like that's where I actually, again, why I love teaching. I, I prefer to teach at a liberal arts school because sure. Like I just did a final project in a, in a music history class. And what I love is I said, like I said, I want y'all to improvise. Like, I'm not going to tell you what to write about, but I want you to incorporate everything we've talked about this musical practice and its history into your own life. So I had kids building computer games where they're finding like having to look for Dizzy Gillespie's bent trumpet or Ornette Coleman's <laughs> like, plastic alto. And I had like students doing stuff on like improvisation and neuroscience response or like yeah. improvisation and soccer or you know, visual art and design. And, but for what I was so psyched about is it wasn't, the world doesn't need more jazz musicians. The mm. world needs more people who know how to improvise and be creative. And I right. think 
that's that's how we need to talk about this work. And then out of that, people who are learning how to improvise and be creative, a bunch of them are going to make music. <laughs> yeah, that's a really beautiful thing to do with those skills. But if we reduce this music's history to just a technique, we've lost, you know. And so I, that's I find that interesting as a teacher. And I think I was so lucky to have had really extraordinarily generous mentors and teachers who made yeah. that very explicit, you know, and and gave me the support to feel that confidence that I was doing something interesting, even if I wasn't doing what everyone else was doing. And yeah. so I just, I find I'm, it's funny to find myself now, middle age, the age <laughs> that my mentors were when I met them, sure. teaching young yeah. people and trying to, you know, inspire in them the same kind of things my mentors inspired in me. And so that part, that transition of it feels very palpable to me these days, particularly this year when I haven't gotten to do any playing and I just done a shit ton of teaching. So, right, right, <laughs> more yeah. so than usual. I'd love to balance that out a little bit more. I'm looking forward to 21, 22 to start actually, you know, playing gigs again, but, yeah. but not in the same way I used to. I'm not, it, that's also nice to, I think another part of that middle-aged, confidence or resignation <laughs> i'm not sure which it is is also that feeling of, of i'm kind of you know I, i'm i'm done with the hustle i feel very happily sort of retired from the business side of it like i have the people i know who support and like my work and will give help me get gigs when i need them but i don't want to ask any i don't want to beg anybody for anything right sure now, you know? so sure. it's kind of nice to be in a spot too I, again this is a digression but i definitely feel the pandemic has clarified my priorities in that I love, I really do enjoy teaching. So I'm happy to have that be a part of my practice. Sure, I love sure. playing. I desperately miss playing and playing with my friends and playing with the people I love, but I don't really miss the hustle at all. I don't miss that side of it at all. So as long as I can generate enough playing opportunities for an audience or not with the people I enjoy, I'm going to be satisfied. I don't need, it's kind of interesting to be in a space where I feel in a very different relationship to the industry or the field than I felt that at any other part in my so-called career, <laughs> so-called jazz, so-called career. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I know what you're saying. Um, the pandemic definitely, uh, cre definitely created, uh, that sense of priority to a lot of musicians because I know so many of them that are now going back to school to become educators. Mm -hmm. And, um, I used to kind of tote my resume in that way where it was like, Hey man, you know, I, I love teaching. Yeah. I teach little kids, but you know, for the following reasons, and this is why it's fun. And I play at night and I do my own thing and all this stuff. And there were definitely naysayers, <laughs> you know? And, and I was like, and now they're, you know, and now I see that people are going to school to get the, to go in the very same direction. So definitely with the, the priority stuff, I, I'm glad that you're, um, enthusiastic about this like bankruptcy in jazz pedagogy i think that the bubble the house the housing housing crisis 2008 recession bubble has not happened yet but i see it um <laughs> i see it forming be, be, because you know and 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 i've brought this up on the show with other guests is the the stress i think in the mainstream of jazz pedagogy is your ability your presence your stature is built on how well you can replicate somebody else's sound mm -hmm. um you know i always say that jazz instagram is probably the most annoying social media media outlet there <laughs> is it's funny my students share with me like things that are memeing on jazz instagram i don't have any social media yeah. And I have to say, when my students do share things with me from Jazz Instagram, I'm like, this is why I have no social media. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's like, look, like some, you know, some of these people are my good friends and I'm not attacking them. I'm just saying, like, why is playing, you know, Hank Mobley's solo on this I dig of you note for note? Why is that the measure of success? Why, you know, why, why isn't your own so, uh, solo written over those changes or I'm not even getting into the specifics of the, of the other either or, but it, it just seems to me. And, you know, I was running this jam session for a couple of years leading up to lockdown. Like I was interacting with a lot of younger mu musicians and it was like all about recognizable vocabulary. And I'm not saying vocabulary is bad. You know, it's fine. It's good. It's great. I have, I use my own, you know, I've copped plenty of Freddie Hubbard licks uh, and play them on the bandstand. But what I'm saying is that I would never, um, I'm not 
one to gauge somebody's uh, 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 abilities or drive or, or interest based on their, their, their ability to sound exactly like somebody else. And I feel like that's getting out of hand. Social media is definitely the culprit of it because, you know, you scroll and you're seeing all, you know, hashtag, hashtag pickup jazz is the stupidest thing I've ever seen, but um, that's a whole other tangent. I'm tangenting. I'm ranting. Anyway, um, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say though, is like, yeah, social media is making it worse. And it's like, there's, it's just the machine element of having to churn out these 800 graduates every yeah. year, every year. And they sound the same. Whereas like, it's definitely due to the fact that they're jazz, jazz pedagogy is not stressing on creativity and not stressing on uh, new things, new ideas. And I'll never forget one of the most heartbreaking moments in college to bring it back to my woe is me stories. Um, <laughs> My combo was going to play The Creator Has a Master Plan by Pharaoh Sanders yeah. for a master class. And I was so excited. I was, you know, boom, goom, 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 yeah. goom, goom, you know, just this fucking mantra chant of a tune. It is meant to, it is a literal meditation in jazz quintet form. And I was so excited to play it. And I'll never forget, we finished it. We probably played like maybe a seven, eight minute version of it. And man, just getting ripped apart for playing that. We were basically first attack. I, I'd say the first 15 minutes was just the audacity to play a Pharaoh Sanders song. That that's, you know what I mean? It was like, we were just like burned at the stake for playing something that stayed on one chord, had one vibe, you know, and, 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 and nobody, nobody um, talked about how, you can build a song like that. Like how you, you know, how you interpret a Pharaoh Sanders song. It was just like the audacity of this group to bring this tune and I'll, and, and, and they killed us, you know? And I remember just being so upset. I was like, I was so excited to play that song and, and man, fuck this place. You know, like yeah. that's, and that, that's, and that's, and that's the, and exactly. I think that's, it's funny. It's like <laughs> whiplash comes up sometimes and people are like, Oh, what do you whiplash? You're a jazz musician. You must like whiplash. I'm like, no, oh, sure. I like whiplash because it demonstrates, I hate the movie, but I, I mean, it's the guy's a good actor. What's his name? The old guy, he's a good actor, but- um, Oh yeah, J.K. Simmons. Yeah, J.K. Simmons is a killer actor. Not, not so much the other, the young guy. But what's great about it was what's terrible about it is it demonstrates everything wrong with jazz pedagogy. It demonstrates- Oh yeah. Art form into a sport. It demonstrates, you know, and this sort of, you know, it, it would be, it would have been a great football movie. It makes it, right? it, it Americanizes music. Yeah. That's and what it, it is. And it turns into a competitive sport and about speed and about, and it's, and about, and it's, that is so infuriating to me because I feel yeah. like not only does it denigrate the music and miss the entire point of the music, it also really denigrate for me, one of the most important things about this music is the mentor mentee relationship and the passage mm -hmm. between generations and the loving two way exchange of information and wisdom and strength and energy and everything that happens in that intergenerational exchange. And it it just misses the point entirely. And it, and that's what I think again, what I think is the danger of, of, of turning a life, practice and again I, I, the institutionalization of not just an art form but a collectivized community pursuit and yeah. you know it's and i think as you put it the americanization is the problem because it's turned it into a judgeable product as opposed to recognizing i mean that's why i think the music is so important because at its core it questions all of our american myths it demonstrates that like capitalism and communism are not necessarily at odds, but actually can be mutually supportive that within a collective context, you can be your best self. You know, yeah. that individual innovation does not have to come at the expense of the ensemble's needs and interests. You know, right. like it demonstrates that these things can work together. And as such, I think it is terribly dangerous. And as such, it gets turned into this sort of parade of great individualism, as opposed to recognizing that it's that it's a, a collectivist nature. And I think that's 
I don't know. That gets a little too conspiracy theory, and I'm not going to go too. No, it's okay. Uh, but you know I, what I'm saying? It's a podcast. We got to get a little conspiracy. Right? No, no, so, I, so definitely. The lizard people have forced us, <laughs> yes, to turn jazz into a competitive sport. Well, so the lizard people lizard people are using jazz to uh, exactly. uh, keep us from fighting back. Um, I'm actually reading a great book about uh, the history of conspiracy theories in America. Uh, yeah. So well, I'm, I'm all about. Oh, I'm all about it. Um, it's called Republic of Lies. Yeah. And yeah it's yeah. Uh, oh god. Of that. It looks interesting. Yeah, Anna Merlin. Uh, so good. So good. I'm, I'm like, uh, it's on Audible, so I'm just like sucking it up. Um, so the thing is, you bring up Whiplash, man. Okay. When that movie was popular, I had to make the conscious effort to swallow my inner hipster critic, you know, jazz vibe, you know, self. Because I was like, and I would say to people, I'm just glad that the number one movie in America is focused on jazz. Like, I'm just, I, you know, you have to just kind of accept, look, this is the popular movie right now. Don't blow it. You know, just be nice. When people, way, it's funny. Like, I think, like, talking about movies and jazz, we just, we've been this moment where a whole bunch of jazz movies just came out. You know, yes. you have like Ma Rainey and Soul and, what Sylvie's love and there's this whole sort of and I feel like this happens every once in a while you know yeah. like there was that moment where like Mo Better Blues and Round Midnight yeah and uh like a couple other films kind of came out when I was in when I was younger there's like a I don't know there's occasional the little bubble of jazz yeah movies. Bird Bird from the early yeah, 90s Bird, that yeah. same era exactly yeah yeah, yeah. um so it's kind of interesting to be in one right now weirdly and this is a little embarrassing because like you know all my Marxist pretensions that I just laid on the floor. I'm like, actually, Pixar kind of got it right. But yeah, like, in yeah. a weird way, I almost feel that like it, it it did almost. I mean, there's obviously a lot of other issues with that movie and all issues with all those movies. And it's interesting to watch them to see how the music gets portrayed. Yeah. But yeah, I hear what you're saying. There's definitely that like, okay, but then it's almost worse if like they miss the point entirely. I mean, yeah, it's, and it's an interesting yeah. question. It's like, was the Ken Burns jazz documentary good or bad? Oh. Like. It got people talking about the music. More people yes. are aware of the music because of that, but it portrayed such a skewed interpretation yes. of history. Yes. Is it, you know, how do you, you know, and I feel all of these things become like that. There's, there's a strength to being obscure. At least you don't get misinterpreted. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So when, yeah. So when whiplash was popular, that was my stance on it. And then I would just remind myself that I love Rocky movies. That doesn't mean they are representative of boxing. You yeah, know, exactly. like you will never watch a fight where every punch <laughs> lands <laughs> like, you know, um, my and then and then to close on whiplash, my favorite line in that entire movie is right before the band goes on. J.K. Simmons goes and trumpets. Don't forget to flat those nines as if that's something you just do. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's I like, laughed. I laughed so hard when I heard that line, like yeah. like. Like it's like it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's like it's like a it's like a physicist watching a time travel movie. It's like, yeah. well, turn on the aeon flux to get yeah. us into the antimatter zone, and like a physicist would be like, that doesn't actually. That's uh, a lot of words that are made. Yeah, what I, I, do, I don't. I was laughing like Robert De Niro and Cape Fear in that movie theater. I was just like, ah, <laughs> ah, 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 you know, yeah. being um, and people thought I was being obnoxious. I'm sure, but I was like. That's not that. Oh man, yeah. trumpets! Yeah. Don't forget the sharp of those knives. That was <laughs> that. Oh god. Yeah, Soul. Man, I haven't thought about this movie uh, since I saw it, but we watched it, and I remember being really pissed off in the first part of it because it was really pushing the "I'm a failure because I didn't become a performer" vibe, and I was like, if this is where the movie's going, I'm gonna be really pissed. Yeah, but I like that it did. It, that was it didn't. No, no, no. Though. To its credit, it certainly, yeah, yeah. it certainly yeah. ended the movie in the exact position I was hoping the movie would be mm -hmm. about. Because as an educator by day and a, I, I, I think of myself as a weekend warrior because I'm not taking Tuesday night gigs. Again, bringing it back to your middle age comment, playing smalls until three in the morning on a Tuesday night doesn't sound that appealing to me at this at this point <laughs> in my life. It would have many years ago, but not now. Anyway, but like. Soul definitely redeemed itself in the in the second act. I feel like in the first act, I was getting really pissed. I was like, oh, but this I, is this is uh, those who can't think, teach uh, like or those who can't do that, teach. But I think it also portrayed that tension of like he actually did like his job and actually yes, did yeah. appreciate his job and still also wanted to be performer. Yes. I have to say that like the conversation with the like 
you know, you got the full, like the mother being like, you finally got a job with health benefits. I was like, wow, that sounds <laughs> that was like my mother. <laughs> disturbingly familiar. Like I've actually yeah. had that exact conversation with my mother. Yes. So yeah. So that I kind mean, of stuff I actually appreciated because I felt it actually captured that's, it's interesting. I did a whole thing in my jazz history course this year that I enjoyed about the economics of jazz and that yeah. like, you have to acknowledge the economic situations and how that affects the choices musicians make, sure. particularly in this music. I think any art, creative art in a free market system is going to be exploited, particularly mm -hmm. any like black art in a system of racial capitalism is going to yes. be exploited. And I think the choices that musicians had available to them and the choices they had to make for economic reasons is a way you have to look at some of the, you know, you can't remove that. You can, again, for me, that's more interesting than what, you know, what note Fats Navarro played over a particular scale. As much as I care about what note Fats Navarro played yeah. over a particular scale. Shout like, out to Fats Navarro. I know, man. you yeah. know, but like the bigger question of like, you know, Duke Ellington took a gig playing so-called jungle music at a segregated club because that was the only option available to him. And yes. he used that as a means to launch a career that did more, said more about black empowerment than anything else could have, but he yeah. had to make that compromise at the beginning. Sure. How else sure. could he have gotten or, out in the late 1920s? You know, and that's yeah. that those kind of questions I think become so salient. Well, and that's, I appreciate films that capture that a little bit. Yeah. You don't have this sort of, oh, you get the big gig. You're like, the thing I liked about Soul is that there's not, he gets the big gig and realizes like, what the, like, just another gig. Like, like you know, gig, like, yeah. what's, what's like, where does one, that's not where you're going to get your satisfaction. Right. I, I they think, don't, the band doesn't even hang out after the gig. They go home. Right. And it's like, yeah, a lot of times that's it. Like, everyone thinks there's this massive hang. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it gets to a point where you just go home. Yeah. Um, yeah and, and talk about conspiratorial. Uh, you know, there's so much, I, I think to the detriment of its, of jazz students, so much about that's that, that economic aspect is left out when you're going to school. Like nobody talks about the fact that when McCoy Tyner left Coltrane's band, he was driving a cab, you mm -hmm. know, nobody, I bring this up incessantly. Nobody talks about that. Kenny Dorham was a mailman during the day. Mm -hmm. And here are these people that we think live in these bubbles where they played every night, and, and, and everything and, was hockey-dory. That's when there was actually a functioning music economy and industry. Right, but right. now you're actually having kids go out with $150,000 in debt to go into a field that actually has less gigs yeah. than Kenny Dorham and McCoy Tenor had in this Exactly, it's exactly. It's criminal. Yeah, it's criminal. It, well, yeah, I mean, man. Uh, those stories are left out. And, and you know, yeah. and, and the reason why, you know, not too many people ask me why I became a teacher, but one of the main reasons was like in my junior year of college at that time, you could be a performance ma major and then come back and, you know, cause a performance degree and an ed degree are basically the same until like your junior year. That's when like you split off and, and focus on your fields. And my school would let you come back and finish the music ed classes that you didn't do junior and senior year. So at that time, my friend was going through what became a diagnosis of Crohn's disease. And I was watching him, you know, kind of suffer to his, to an extent. And I was like, and, and I remember he said to me, and he was this, he, he still is. He is one of the most killing guitar players I've ever met in my life. He can go toe to toe with anybody as far as I'm concerned. And you put an organ trio behind him. He's dangerous. And he said to me, I got to do this. I'm going to do this program. I got to do this. I need health insurance because mm -hmm. I, you know, he, he's got this condition. And I remember like, that was a key moment in my life. And I was like, wow, I, what if I have an underlying condition I don't know about, and it's going to spring up when I'm 28 or something like that, mm -hmm. you know? And then, you know, and so that was one of the reasons I went in this field. You could say it was a safe choice. It was a smart choice when I look back on it, but the ends always justify the means. I never once had to take a gig to keep the lights on. I never, you know, I never had to take gigs. I didn't want to take. We're talking about like not being the most killing or the most loud or the highest playing. I always could just focus on the music I wanted to play and the, and the stuff I wanted to do because I had kind of no, my platform. Was, I, remember, you know? I remember years ago when I was probably in my early twenties, that's the advice Bill Lowe gave me. And he said, look, it's like, you look like you want to do this for real and do this for your life and do this, you know, as your avocation. He's like, but just recognize like 
you're not going to be able to make the music you want to make and support yourself. That's just yeah. not a reality. So it's like, right. there's multiple paths and all of these are noble paths. Like there's some people who are like, I just need to play music full time. So I'll take whatever gig is offered, whether it's playing at a wedding or playing in a pit band or playing on a show or playing behind backing a pop singer. I'll take the gig because I want to play music full time. Yeah. That's a great choice. And that's a particular choice. There's also the folks who are like, I will drive a cab. So yeah. I have my income is covered and I can play the music I want to play and I can punch in and punch out nine to five. As soon as I'm done working, I'm no longer a cab driver. I'm a musician and I can do my music, yeah. but you have to, you know, you also take in. And then he's like, you know, I took the job of being a teacher where it's like, you're talking about music. You're involved in music. You yeah. can't turn it off at five o'clock the way you could, if you were working in a, in the post office or in a cab where it's like, okay, I'm done. Like teaching bleeds into the rest of your life. It's more yeah. intense. It's more emotionally engaged, but you maybe are teaching about the music you love. And then you do the music on top of that. Each of those has its pros and cons, but sure. it was very helpful for me to have a mentor lay out that as the options without being like, oh, don't worry, you'll get your record deal. You'll, you'll get into the big band and you'll make it. He's like, no, that doesn't happen. You'll have incredible yeah. opportunities. You'll create incredible opportunities, but you have to keep, you have to be cognizant of how you're going to survive. And it's not going to be just from like doing, you know, the right. gigs you want to do and the music you want to make. Well, that's there's very yeah. important advice that again, yeah. I think. It's insane that schools don't offer that kind well, of advice or training. Right, they they can't afford to. To be, I I know that's yeah, cynical, but they it. can't. I mean, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, they would they would just cease to exist eventually. Lie. <laughs> like, well, yeah, exactly. Uh, don't you know? Don't mind the man behind the curtain. But yeah. you know, there's no band. There's no bands. You, 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 mm -hmm. No one's getting out of college and getting hired by like the Jazz Messengers or Horse yeah, Silver. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. no, there's no, yeah. there's no, you know, those those situations. So you, if you don't get a mentor who isn't honest with you, you don't, you know, th this stuff, uh, you know, hits you harder. I think you need someone. I think, I think nowadays a jazz, a jazz student benefits the most from having a mentor who's honest with them, who will take those rose colored glasses away, mm -hmm. show them what the life looks like for real. And, and that also, you know, that will weed out who want, who's really in this and who's not, you know, yeah, yeah. um, you know, uh, when, 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 when Herbie, you know, disbanded the M1 Dishi band, like Eddie went back to practicing medicine and that's what he did. And he, you know, he worked in a clinic during the day and he played at night when, mm -hmm. when, you know, and that's a fine life, like, you yeah, know, you, don't, exactly. you know, and that's, and that's a great, that's a great career. And I kind of feel the same way. I try to encourage younger musicians to become teachers. Cause I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, I, yeah, I have to get up really early. I gotta like, you know, pack a lunch and stuff, but I, I get paid a pretty good amount to like play piano and sing with kids. Yeah. Like there's worse, <laughs> there's worse jobs than that, you know? And then at night I go play, a, you know, Friday night I go play a gig. It's a pretty sick lifestyle. If yeah, I do say yeah, so absolutely. myself, like, absolutely. you know, so I, I think with the, you know, again, digressing to the pandemic, I think that kind of showed that to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people who should be teachers are going to go into teaching. Cause a couple of my friends who have done this, I, I feel like we'd be really good in these situations. And I'm kind of glad that like the economic hardships forced them in that direction because I think they needed a nudge and they got it. And now they're going to do their, do good things. And they're going to see that you can still play the gigs. Yeah, are still, so. you know? I'd like to think so. And then, and then I think there so. is, you know, and there are, as I said before, there's, there's, there's creative freedom in obscurity. That's actually yeah. quite valuable. And I would yeah. take over the, sometimes the limitations of success. That's why I turned down all that success that was offered for me. I sure. was really like, no, no, no. I'm going to take the freedom that's in the obscurity. Yeah. I'm joking. I haven't had a lot of success. Yeah, but like, to me. but I, I, if I, I did, I, I know you're joking. <laughs> I, I know you're joking, but like, I kind of get it. Like, you know, like, I, I'm like, yeah, okay, I just, that sounds I good to me. I was joking, just in case your listeners didn't. Like, yeah. You know, it's like, damn, that guy was egotistical. I don't know what's up. Oh, you yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah. Um, real quick, uh, before I forget, because we got, you know, I, I'm dying to know what were some of the, what were, what were some of the albums, uh, uh, that really turned the lights on for you to go in this direction? Like you, I mean, you had to have had a favorite, you know, we're talking about Clifford Brown. You had to have had a favorite Brownie record or a favorite miles record, but like, what, what, what did you listen to? That was like, you know, shit. I like this way more, or like, this is the direction I want to go in yeah, or something say, like I mean, that. It's, it's, and actually it's funny when you think about that, the stuff that's revealed is often does, I think I've finally gotten there in my aesthetic in a weird way. Um, but 
when I was a kid, like high school going into college, when you're falling in love with this music, I still very much remember when I was maybe 14 or 15, there's a time I actually heard In a Silent Way and really heard it for the first time. And it was really oh. the, almost the first time I really heard any music. Like when you actually kind of unlock the code and you start hearing what's happening and the way the different instruments are interacting and the way the grooves and the and everything is coming together. So for me, In a Silent Way was definitely that. Um, the that was for two, me too. Oh, really? I'm sorry oh, to interrupt you. Yeah, In a Silent Way was, I heard it, um, the first Miles album I ever heard was Seven Steps to Heaven. I remember thinking the ballads were boring. The fast songs were fun. Um, <laughs> but I think maybe the third, second or third album, definitely the first Miles album I bought was In a Silent Way. And I used to work at a subway. That was my first job. And in my senior year of high school, I would uh, do the closing shift. So in the last half hour of the night, 930, I would blast in a silent way while I was like mopping the floor and stuff. And and man, that was it for me. I, yeah. And it definitely sent me down like my 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 number one fave is any kind of vamp, <laughs> any kind of, you know, and, and, and it makes sense that the, that Herbie's M1 DC band would be yeah, so yeah. important to me yeah, next because yeah. a lot of it is very similar. And man, it's, it's just awesome to hear that, to talk about that record, that in no, a silent no, way. I, yeah, no. I, and I remember, yeah, I remember walking home, like on a snowy night, listening to it on my cassette Walkman. This is, you know, to date myself. Yeah. And like, but like just hearing the magic in it for the first time. And yeah. so that, and then other records, like I love Supreme. I remember I spent about a year in high school listening to that, like four times a night, just like really obsessively. Wow. That was, and it's funny because I was teaching that this year. And so I re-listened to it for the first time in like a decade. And it was, it, <laughs> shocker, a love supreme holds up, you know? <laughs> but I have to, that is one news thing. News flash. <laughs> I know. Good album, that, that a love supreme. Yeah. Um, but I realized that's one thing I've actually really loved about teaching is it's returned me to some of my like core albums. Like I've ended yeah. up teaching. The other record that was incredibly important to me, especially in that sort of same late high school, early college years, was Electric Ladyland. And oh, 19, yeah. 1983, a merman I should turn to be. That was like, that was another kind of game changer for me. And then I got into the weirder shit and the more normal shit. Like, I, I, but it's interesting. I kind of started at the very space that's in between jazz and rock and free and straight ahead. Like all of that stuff, you know, all of that stuff kind of uses noise, yep. you know, uses electronics, uses more extended techniques while also still having some rhythm, still having some big melodies. And as I've grown up, <laughs> now that I like to think I'm close to grown up, um, it's like I've kind of nailed my aesthetic. I'm just like, you know, I like noisy, weird shit that occasionally breaks out into a big melody. Like I'm yeah. kind of a sucker for that or like settles into a satisfying groove and then abandons the groove. And I find and I find that ends up being where a lot of my work ends up going and a lot of the stuff that really I enjoy, whether it's classical or rock or hip hop yeah. or jazz, whatever genre, I often find that there's certain some of those elements will be in there. You know what I mean? The sense of yeah. control and the sense of abandoning control and the noise and the melody and, you know, some of those, some of those juxtapositions. I'm right there with you, man. Like I, I was so annoyed, <laughs> you know, freshman year, sophomore year of college. And I'm, and I'm having to learn like Stella by starlight and all in like at that time I'm into, you know, yeah. In a sound way, bitches brew red clay was really big for me. And because of the same thing, there's like these free blowing intros. And mm -hmm. if you listen to, um, uh, I think it's called cold Turkey, man. I can't believe I'm forgetting oh, yeah, the track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The last yeah. track on red clay yeah. is like fucking weird. And yeah. I, and I, and, you know, and then it breaks out into this groove and I was like, why can't we do songs like that? <laughs> That's what I want to do, yeah, yeah. you know? And, and, you know, it's just, I, and it's funny. I feel like that will always be at my core. It's like th that was the stuff that I was really into. I love bop and I love, I love hard bop and, and, and all that other stuff too. But I always wanted to pursue that stuff more. And, well, and now I feel like I can, but. And the thing that I, again, not, not to keep beating the, the unfortunately not yet dead horse that is uh, institutionalized jazz pedagogy. Right. But the other thing I think I learned later on by the sort of, obsessive focus on sort of 19 whatever 48 to 1962 or whatever that yeah sort of, i actually am more naturally attracted to the earlier shit and the later shit <laughs> like yeah. i love like i would rather listen to cootie williams and bubber miley than almost any other trumpet player you know yeah. like i the earth like red allen rex stewart like what yeah. they were doing with the instrument and then what like lester Bowie and don cherry were doing with the instrument that was the bill dixon like that was the stuff that i was more attracted to 
was when you really, but I was like, then why are they only teaching these 15 years that I like, that I revere? I, I, I know we're not saying we don't, don't like it. it yeah. Being the, like, why, why did that become the standard? Yeah. And like, and in some ways also as a composer, for me, as much as like, I appreciate a well-crafted AABA, you know, jazz standard tune, like that's kind of the least interesting compositional period where it was mm. just, you play the head, everybody blows, you play the head out. Yeah. And you look at the more intricate structures, either of like Ellington and Fletcher Henderson and Mary Lou Williams or of Braxton and Threadgill and Wadada, you're like, why would I just want to write a tune and then play with the change and play the tune? Like they're cre- like, there's so much more you can do as a composer. Right. So for me, again, it just becomes while I, again, still revere it. It's just not the era of music that I feel the most immediately attracted to. And so I almost find it bizarre that that becomes the one that's so solely hot and line and I, like that's become what jazz is and i well, find that so, yeah such a strange i don't know it's just a strange thing and so it's nice to remember the larger perspective yeah I'm, I'm not shitting on bebop at all i love bebop but bebop is the only form of the music that has strict rules and that's yeah. and that's yeah. why they teach it because then they could say if it's right or wrong and yeah, exactly, you know and, exactly. and and that's and that's the thing i i feel like people you know it's funny like a younger cat i i'm friends with he I feel like once he started listening to more post pop, he like started, he started talking about my playing and it was like, I, I understand you more, your approach more now that I've listened to like maiden voyage and uh, you know, point of departure and all, and, and all these like post bop albums, mm-hmm. because it's like, well, yeah, like, I like having a little freedom in there. Like it, it's you also know. crazy. I'm saying it's kind of, I mean, those are great albums. Sure. But it's crazy that like, albums from 55 years ago yeah. are yeah. still seen as like like the cutting edge avant-garde for someone yeah. coming out of a jazz conservatory yeah like I that's got, crazy yeah you know? i i've got a great i've got a great friend who is a, a wonderful reed player and he's a you know a bop machine he swings his ass off man he has like no no um experience in like anything avant-garde and i'm always like oh man haven't you checked this out have you checked this out he's never and it's so crazy it's like man Again, these albums could be 60 years old, but when you hear them, you're going to, your brains are going to be on the wall because you've never like really dug into them. And that's, and that's kind of nuts, you know, cause yeah, it's, yeah. it's like this stuff came out 30 years before you were even born. Like, I know, you know, I know. It's, that's the thing that again, it's, it's, we've become such an a historical, we've, we've developed such an a historical perspective on the music. Yeah. And I feel like that's one of our roles as educators or as as advocates or as organizers is to try and reestablish the bigger picture. Yeah. You know, it's funny, you know, I mentioned my, my good friend uh, is a wonderful cellist and composer named Tamika Reed. And both of us were working on teaching a new jazz history course this year at different schools. So we were yeah. swapping syllabuses and cool. reading through all these jazz history books. And we're like, fuck it. None of these cover it. Like, let's so I really think we're going to try to write our own, not necessarily like a nuts and bolts history of like, oh, Arms- like Bolden happened and then Armstrong happened yeah. and then Eldridge happened and then we moved on. But like just almost a series of articles and essays that like contextualizes the music and kind of raises up what we think as musicians is important because yeah. that's not what is talked about. Like it's sort of reduced to like a bu- it's like reduced to the back of a baseball card of like who yeah. played with who, when, yeah. but like, what about, what about motivation? What about, and also what about the characters? Like you learn more, not from the superstars, but from the people in the trenches. Like we've yeah. all, we've, we've seen enough movies and read and I like, I love Miles Davis, not personally he was a fucked up human being, but <laughs> like, like as a musician, he changed my life, but we've read and there's enough movies and books and articles about Miles Davis. What about Mungese Faza? What about Barbara Donald? What about yeah. Fats Navarro? What about yeah. Bubber Miley? Like yep. you learn more from the fringe characters about sure. what's really happening with the music. Cause that's actually the story. Like the story of this music is not the five people who became superstars, yep. you know, the story of the music is the 500,000 that contributed to it in the trenches, making the work happen. Oh yeah. Sharing the ideas. And I feel yep. like that's the kind of, we just want to cut. I'm just very interested in sort of radically changing the way we talk about this music. And rather than looking at like, purely stylistic evolutionary in a vacuum yeah there's also philosophical and and you know sort of activized practice that that i think is so interesting you know and i think yeah yeah there's so much social social uh you know the social justice aspect of the music you know like like i mean yeah 
you know, uh, it's it did not occur in a vacuum. It, 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 it had it reacted to what it was, what was going on around the, you know, in the world and, and vice versa. And, and, and in a yeah, moment right looks- now when a lot of shit's going on in the world, it feels important to try to do whatever small parts we all can do individually. And Absolutely. To re- make, reestablish those connections, to yeah. reestablish this as an experimental playground for radical ideas and inspirational thought and, you know, spiritual enlightenment and all of the things that are embedded inside of it that have been kind of ignored. I think it's, it's, it's really time to, it's past time for all of us to like foreground and celebrate that because we need it right now. We definitely need it right now. You know, not that I I definitely am not idealistic in the sense that music is going to save the world, but I would definitely say if we are going to save the world, it's not going to happen without music. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you know? That's, that's the t-shirt right there. That's the t-shirt. I like that. Well, Taylor, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, man. Great to catch up with you. Yeah, I know. I, I know, man. Um, you know, stay warm up there. <laughs> <laughs> I will. And, Spring is knocking at the door. Yeah. I look yeah. forward to when it breaks through. It, yeah. It's close. It's close. But when, uh, um, when I'm, I'll be fully vaccinated in a week, and oh, when, beautiful. And, that's, yeah, that's an and, advantage uh, of being a K twelve teacher. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but when things are a little bit more open up, I, I I really look forward to getting together and just playing trumpet, trumpet and cornet, man. Definitely, man. I look so. forward to it too. We'll get down to. I want to hear the Elm City Big Band right off. Oh, I, I know. Well, yeah, I, I I will. I will. Uh, just you know it's i i feel like it's it's coming all that stuff's coming back so. <laughs> all right all right man well, all great right to see you thanks for doing this and, yeah uh good luck with it. yeah talk to you thanks, soon thanks for being on Uh, thanks to Taylor for joining me on the show. That was a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoy uh, these interviews as much as I do. I know I say that all the time, but man, it's so fun. It's so fun to being able to catch up with uh, someone like him who I haven't seen. And, you know, like I was saying before, he, he we used to live down the street from each other I, when I was in Hamden and he was in uh, Fairfield, Fairhaven Heights in New Haven. Um you know, I felt I feel lucky that uh, we were able to uh, hang out as much as we did. But, man, could have hung out more, <laughs> you know. So uh, that that interview was especially uh, special in that regard. So check out Taylor's music. Um, you know, go to, uh, you know, I don't want to say Spotify, but go on Spotify, go on, you know, Apple. You could definitely find a lot of his stuff on Bandcamp. Yes, that's the angle, right? Bandcamp. Go on Bandcamp, check his stuff out, uh, whether it's his duo playing with Toma Fujiwara or his sextet, which includes Mary Halverson, Jim Hobbs, um, Toma, again, a lot of the musicians we were talking about. Um, and then, you know, some of the other projects he's been on, some of the, uh, for instance, some of the uh, Anthony Braxton records of the last, like, you know, five years, you could definitely find on uh, on Bandcamp. I know they're available on uh Apple Music and, uh, you know, for those cheapos out there, um, uh, Spotify as well. (laughs) I'm just as bad, but I am trying to get better at uh, buying on Bandcamp. I just dropped like a hundred bucks on Bandcamp a couple weeks ago. So I'm, I know I'm doing my part. Make sure you're doing yours. And I believe this Friday, which, uh, today's March 24th. So March 26th, will be another uh, Bandcamp Friday. So, you know, they waive all the fees. Go support your favorite artists and uh, support, you know, support, support, support. That's all I could say. Just beat it over the head and uh, check out some of Taylor's music because it really is awesome and original. So, again, thanks, Taylor, for being on the show. So episode 26 in the bag. Thanks so much, everybody, for listening and tuning in regularly. Uh, It really is a labor of love, and I'm trying to really, you know, get a gist for what the show is. And um, so last week had Eddie Henderson. This week had Taylor Hobinum. Next week, I have Joe Magnarelli. It's a triple 
trumpet threat. So definitely tune in next week uh, and and check out my interview with Joe Magnarelli. And uh, yeah, keep you know just subscribe to all the NHJU stuff. Keep in the keep yourself in the loop. Uh, music's coming back. I'm I'm super excited for everything. So you know I love you all. I want everybody to be safe. Get your vaccination appointments uh, so we can all hang out in a tightly, uh, you know, enclosed space and not have to worry. So anyway, this has been Mr. Millennial's Revenge. I'm your host, Nick DiMaria. This is a production of the New Haven Jazz Underground. I will see you at the next episode. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care.